Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week we are going to be talking about a serial killer case, a serial killer that I actually had never heard of until recently when I think it was suggested to me in the comments of one of my latest videos so I started looking into it and it is a crazy roller coaster of a case there is so much to delve into here in the late 1990s four brutal murders were carried out in the city of Chicago and for months and months the police worked so hard to try and catch the killer but unfortunately the case would go cold until DNA and forensic technology was able to identify who committed these horrific crimes and when the police looked into this person they were shocked to find that he was responsible for a lot more than they first thought. But before we get into the case I would just like to say a massive thank you to Disney Plus for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now you guys know I am a huge fan of Disney Plus. I've been using their service ever since it launched and recently I I have really been enjoying watching The Book of Boba Fett. The Book of Boba Fett is a Star Wars original series with new episodes streaming every single Wednesday exclusively on Disney+. Plus. The series follows bounty hunter Boba Fett and the elite assassin Fennec Shand as they navigate the galaxy's underworld and return to the Tatooine desert. It was once ruled by Jabba the Hutt and his crime syndicate but now Boba Fett has returned to claim his territory and become Tatooine's new crime boss. I was honestly so excited to watch this series because I grew up watching all of the Star Wars movies. I would always watch them with my mum because she was and still is such a huge Star Wars fan. I've watched three episodes of the book of Boba Fett so far and I am completely hooked. I'm so looking forward to the next episode because the previous one was left on a bit of a cliffhanger so I can't wait to see what happens next. Hands down, my favourite character has to be Fennec Shand. I always find in movies and TV shows that my favourite characters tend to be those badass strong women and that is just Fennec in a nutshell. She's tough, she's mighty. There's a scene in episode one where she chases after a couple of Nightwind assassins after they attack her and Boba Fett and without spoiling anything she absolutely destroys them. It's just such a sick scene. She's such a cool character and I'm so excited to see her development as the series progresses. Another element of the show that I have been really enjoying is the flashback scenes which show parts of Boba Fett's past. So for example in the first episode we see how he survived his fall into the Sarlacc stomach in Return of the Jedi and how he escapes. It's so interesting to see more of Boba's history from the previous Star Wars movies and I can't wait to keep watching. I'm so looking forward to to watching the rest of the series and I cannot recommend it to you guys enough. So if you would like to watch the book of Boba Fett or any other of the original and exclusive shows and movies that Disney Plus has to offer then you can click the link at the top line of the description box to get your Disney Plus subscription which is just $7.99 a month. Once again thank you so so much to Disney Plus for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel and now let's just get into the case. So our case today begins in early 1997 in the city of Chicago in Illinois in the United States. It was around midday on the 10th of January 1997 when emergency services were called to a house fire on Tui Avenue in northern Chicago. The fire had been discovered by a furnace repairman. He had an appointment at this specific house, this specific bungalow that day to fix a furnace in the home. However, when he arrived, 
escaped, he found that the place was on fire and so he called for help. Firefighters were immediately sent to the scene and they began trying to put the fire out, which was mainly towards the back of the property. It seemed as though the fire had started around the back of the bungalow. So they started putting it out and they also started just going through the home to see if there was anyone in there that needed rescuing. And when they went through to the back of the bungalow, they found someone. It was a woman and she was lying face down on a bed and unfortunately it was too late. She was already dead and it was believed that she had died from smoke inhalation before the fire team even arrived. This woman was the only person in the bungalow at the time so she was the only victim of this house fire and they were soon able to identify her after finding her purse containing her ID in the property. This woman that had died was Dorota Dubag. She was 30 years old and she was the owner of the bungalow. However, she was originally from Poland, but she moved over to the US about 10 years earlier in the hopes of building a better life in America. And Dorota was a mother, a single mother. She had a daughter who was just five years old and Dorota was working so incredibly hard to provide for her child. However, now that child, her daughter was motherless because obviously Dorota passed away in January of 1997 in the house fire and thankfully her daughter was not at home at the time so she was safe. But after Dorota had been identified her body was taken for an autopsy and the fire team got to work on trying to work out how the fire had started. Was this caused by an issue with the electrics in the home? Did Dorota herself accidentally start the fire? Maybe she was smoking and she didn't put out a cigarette. Maybe she was cooking and something just went up in flames. They did believe that this was just a tragic accident. Somehow the fire accidentally started and just got out of control and Dorota died as a result. However, the police got a massive shock when Dorota's autopsy determined that her death and the circumstances surrounding it weren't as clear cut as they first thought. Because despite the fact that her body had sustained some burn injuries, the medical examiner discovered that Dorota had actually been manually strangled to death. She had sustained severe damage to her hyoid bone, which is the bone in the throat, and she had hemorrhaging in her eye from broken blood vessels, which is something that is seen a lot in victims who have been strangled. In addition to that, it was also also noted by the coroner that Dorota had ligature marks on her wrist from where she had previously been bound and he also believed that she had been sexually assaulted too. And during an examination of her lungs it was also determined that she had no soot in there so that means that Dorota must have already been dead before the fire started because she wasn't breathing and taking in any smoke. So Dorota Dubak had actually been murdered. Her death wasn't just a tragic accident caused by the house fire. She had been strangled to death and then the fire had clearly been set by the killer in an attempt to cover up what they had done. So now that they had Dorota's autopsy results, the police were hopeful that they might be able to find some of the killer's DNA on Dorota's body because obviously DNA evidence should help them identify the perpetrator quicker. But unfortunately, because of the fire, if there was any trace of DNA evidence on her body or at the crime scene it would have been destroyed which would have obviously been what the killer wanted and intended. So because of this setback they started looking into Dorota's background trying to determine whether this murder was personal, whether she had been killed by someone that she knew. However, this line of inquiry didn't really result in any suspects. Dorota was a woman that was very well liked. She didn't seem to have any issues or problems with anyone in her life. Although the police did quickly conclude that the killer hadn't broken into Dorota's bungalow. There were no signs of forced entry. So it seemed as though she must have let them 
into her home. She let the killer in. It was also discovered that Dorota was actually selling her home at the time of her murder. She was privately selling it on her own and she had a for sale sign outside of her property with her phone number on it. And it was following this discovery that the police had an idea of what might have happened here. They theorised that maybe Dorota's killer was someone that had contacted her and asked to view her house. They pretended that they were interested in buying it. So they set up a house viewing with Dorota and when they arrived at her home they sexually assaulted and killed her. And this theory was later backed up once the police spoke to one of Dorota's friends. You see shortly before the fire started that day Dorota had spoken to this friend on the phone and she told her that she was waiting in her home for a man to arrive because he was going to have a look around her bungalow. He was interested in potentially buying it. However, Dorota said that she was feeling a little bit nervous about this house viewing because she told her friend that that same man had been over just the day before to see the house and he was just a bit strange. Just the way he was, the way he acted made Dorota feel a little bit uncomfortable. There was just something off about this guy and as I said he was due to come over for another viewing that day, the day of her murder. In fact when she was on the phone to her friend Dorota said that the man was on his way over and he should be arriving any minute now and Dorota even said to her friend can you please phone me back in a little while just to check on me. That's how anxious she was about this person coming over again. However, when this friend did ring back about 30 minutes later, Dorota didn't pick up the phone. And so her friends started to worry. And so she got in contact with the police and she asked them if they could conduct a welfare check, if they could go over to Dorota's house and just make sure that she was okay. However, around that same time, the furnace repairman arrived at the property. Dorota also had an appointment with him that day because her furnace was broken and she wanted him to fix it and when he got there he immediately rang 911 because Dorota's home was on fire and of course we know what happened after that the firefighters were sent to the scene they put the fire out and they found Dorota's dead body inside and she had been murdered so now the police strongly believed that that man the man that had arranged a house viewing with Dorota Rota was the one who killed her but obviously at this point the police had absolutely no idea who he was and so they started trying to find out. They began going through Dorota's phone records because Dorota told her friend that she had spoken to the man twice on the phone the morning of her murder. That was when he asked if he could come back and view the property again. So they had to look at her phone records and they traced the two phone calls that this man made. However when they did this they decided discovered that the two calls had been made from a payphone located pretty close to Dorota's home. It was less than two blocks away. So this killer was smart. He was good at knowing how to cover his tracks. He made the call from a payphone so that it couldn't be traced back to him. He set Dorota's house on fire so that the chances of any DNA evidence being found were very slim. He knew what he was doing. He knew how to avoid being caught. The police did dust the payphone for fingerprints but of course it's a public phone. Many people used it so this didn't result in anything. They also checked to see if there were any CCTV cameras around the payphone or nearby but there weren't so they had no camera evidence. They also conducted door-to-door -door inquiries and spoke to everyone that lived nearby asking if they had seen anything, if they saw the person that made the calls at the payphone or if they saw a man go into Dorota's house but no one really did. There was nothing. The police had virtually no evidence in this case. No leads, no DNA, no CCTV footage, no suspects, nothing to go on. And so as the days and the weeks went by, Dorota's case remained unsolved and her killer remained at large. And then less than a month later, on the 3rd of February 1997, it seemed as though there was another house fire in Chicago. However, once again, 
not all was as it first seemed. This second house fire happened in a neighbourhood called Balmon Cragen, which is just over six miles away from Tui Avenue where Dorota lived. And that day, the 3rd of February, a man named Dennis Cassio was taking out some rubbish to put in the bin outside. Now, Dennis was actually a landlord. I believe he owned an apartment building in that neighbourhood. And when he was taking the garbage out, he actually noticed that there was smoke coming out of the apartment building that he owned, a lot of smoke. And so he immediately rang the emergency services. Firefighters were sent to the scene. They quickly determined which apartment in this apartment building was on fire and they started putting it out. And following this, they found two people in the apartment and these two people were dead. Sadly, there was no way of saving them. It was two females that they found in the apartment. One seemed to be an adult woman, however the other was actually a child. They found the body of a young girl and immediately it was obvious that foul play was involved here. This wasn't just a tragic accident. They hadn't died as a result of an accidental house fire because when the bodies were found, they were bound, their hands were tied behind their backs and they had been gagged to obviously stop them from screaming and shouting for help. And it was eventually determined that they had died as a result of their three throats being slashed with a knife so they had been viciously murdered and then their bodies and the scene had been set on fire using an accelerant by the killer to cover up the crime. These victims were soon identified as being mother and daughter Yolanda Gutierrez and Jessica Muniz. Yolanda was 35 years old and her daughter Jessica was just 10 years old and they lived on their own. It was just the two of them living in that apartment. Yolanda was a single mother and she adored Jessica so much and Jessica loved her mother. They were described as being like a little team. So after their bodies were found, a murder investigation was launched and the police and forensic teams began looking for evidence. Unfortunately, again, they knew that the chances of finding DNA evidence was slim because it probably would have been destroyed by the fire. But they checked for fingerprints at the scene anyway and meanwhile the medical examiner was taking samples from the bodies to see if the killer's DNA was still present on them despite the fact that their bodies had been badly burned. The medical examiner did determine that both of the victims had been sexually assaulted so whoever had done this had assaulted not just Yolanda but 10 year old Jessica as well which is just horrific but it did result in a breakthrough in the case because traces of the killer semen were found inside the body of 10 year old Jessica so now that they had the killer's DNA it was sent off for testing and it was found to have belonged to a white male however unfortunately when his DNA profile was entered onto the DNA database there was no match, the killer's DNA was not on there. But it was still a big development in the case, even though there was no match on the database at this moment in time, at least they had the killer's DNA, which they could test against any people of interest and suspects in the future. The DNA was tested against, I believe, all of the men in Yolanda and Jessica's lives, all of their male relatives and male friends, but none of them were a match, none of them had anything to do with this double homicide. And so the search for evidence continued and interestingly one of the things that the detectives actually found inside Yolanda and Jessica's apartment was some flyers that Yolanda had made and these flyers were to basically advertise some books that she was selling and she had been putting these flyers up in like local shops and on bulletin boards with her phone number on them telling people to contact her if they were interested in buying them and so the police speculated that maybe the killer was someone that had contacted Yolanda pretending to be interested in purchasing her books and when they arrived at her apartment to pick them up instead they just murdered her and her daughter. So with this theory in mind they started going through Yolanda's phone records and they traced two calls that had been made to her I believe on the day of her death. However both of these calls had been made from a payphone 
alone near her apartment building, meaning that unfortunately the person who made these calls could not be identified. But it's all sounding very familiar, isn't it? There were a lot of similarities between the murder of Yolanda and Jessica and the murder of Dorota Dubak. They were all killed in their homes. Both Yolanda and Dorota were advertising something that they had for sale. Dorota was selling her house and Yolanda was selling some books. Both of them had been contacted by someone who used a payphone to make the calls so that they couldn't be traced. All three victims had been sexually assaulted and after the murders, their homes had been set on fire in an attempt to get rid of any crime scene evidence. The only real difference between the two cases was the method of killing. As we know, Dorota was manually strangled to death, whereas Yolanda and Jessica had their throats cut. So very, very similar cases that only happened a month apart, less than a month actually. So I think the police did believe that these were probably connected, that Yolanda and Jessica were killed by the same man that murdered Dorota but at the same time there was no concrete link they didn't have any solid evidence linking the two crimes but the details surrounding the cases do suggest that they were and then just over four weeks after Yolanda and Jessica's murder tragedy struck the city of Chicago once again when firefighters were called to the scene of yet another house fire it was the 14th of March 19 1997 when a neighbor called emergency services reporting that one of the local houses or apartments was ablaze. This apartment was on Kenneth Avenue in Chicago which is only about three miles away from Balmont Cragen where Yolanda and Jessica lived and were killed. Once firefighters arrived they started putting the fire out which was mainly in the bathroom of the home so it seemed as though that's where the fire had started in the bathroom and once they got it under control when they extinguished it they discovered a very gruesome scene in that bathroom they found the dead body of a woman I believe she was in the bathtub and she had clearly been the victim of a brutal attack she was found naked from the waist down the bottom half of her body was exposed which indicated to the police that she had been sexually assaulted and it was determined that that she had been beaten up viciously. She had severe head injuries. She had also been stabbed with a knife. She had been bound. It was concluded in her autopsy that she had been manually strangled and whoever had done this had then set her body on fire using an accelerant. This murder victim was eventually identified as being Casimira Peru. She was 43 years old and she was the owner of the apartment that her body was found in. She lived there by herself, although she was originally from Poland and Casimira's plan was to actually sell her apartment and move back to Poland. She wanted to go back and so she was actively looking for a buyer and she had a for sale sign outside of her apartment with her phone number on it just like Dorota Dubak. So instantly there is an obvious connection here. The theory again was that Casimira was contacted by someone pretending to be interested in buying her home but then when they came round to view it they attacked and murdered her. So the police began tracing Casimira's phone calls and what do you know they found that a number of the calls made to her in the lead up to her death had been made from a payphone. So it it was after Casimira's murder that the Chicago police were just like, surely this cannot be a coincidence. These three cases surely must have been linked because they were just so, so similar. There were so many similarities between them. However, once again, there was no concrete link between the three crimes because no trace of the killer's DNA was found on Casimira's body. The fire had destroyed any chance of that. The only DNA evidence the police had so far was in Yolanda and Jessica's case. If you remember, the killer seemed 
semen was found on 10 year old Jessica's body but no DNA evidence was found in Dorota Dubak's case or the case of Casimira Peru so they couldn't link the three cases forensically but despite the lack of DNA evidence the police just knew that these horrific murders had to have been committed by the same person they had a serial killer on their hands and they knew that if they didn't catch him quickly it would only be a matter of time before he struck again but catching him was proving to be incredibly difficult because like I mentioned earlier they had his DNA but they couldn't match it to anyone there was no match on the DNA database and other than that they didn't really have any leads or lines of inquiry to investigate and go down and so in a desperate bid for help the police turned to the FBI and they asked them if they could assist in coming up with a profile of the perpetrator what kind of man this killer was they knew from the DNA that it was a white male and the FBI investigators concluded that this killer was probably someone that was able to charm people. He was able to kind of get people to trust him easily because obviously the theory was that he was gaining access to his victims' homes by pretending to be interested in whatever they were selling. It was also suggested that this killer loved the torture aspect of these crimes more than anything else. He loved seeing his victims in pain. He probably got some kind of sick sexual enjoyment from that and also he was someone that was quite brazen and brave because he was committing these murders literally in the middle of the day and a lot of the time I would say the majority of the time actually in true crime cases the crime is carried out at night when obviously it's dark and most people are at home asleep because then there is less chance of being caught and someone seeing you whereas this killer was attacking these women in the middle of the day and he almost just didn't care he was probably well aware of the risk of someone seeing him but he was doing it anyway. So after the third murder case of Casimira Peru happened in March of 1997, the police knew that they had to warn the public. They potentially had a serial killer on their hands and so they needed the public to be aware. So they told the local community that this killer seemed to be targeting women who were advertising something and selling something and they told the public to just be careful, be extra careful when it comes to putting putting classified ads up or privately selling your home and be wary of who you let into your home. So people were absolutely terrified. I can imagine how scary it must be living in an area where you know a killer is lurking and potentially looking for his next victim. And so naturally, because of how scared everyone was, there was even more heat on the police, even more pressure to apprehend this extremely dangerous man. So in an attempt to identify him, the police started going through all of their records of criminals in the area, sex offenders, anyone that had ever been to prison or even just been arrested for any kind of violent crime because it's high likely that their killer had some history of that in their background but they couldn't link any of them to any of the cases despite all their hard work they still couldn't find the killer and as time went by this investigation kind of started to go quiet it actually seemed as though the killer had just stopped randomly for some reason. There were no more similar murders and no more house fires of a similar nature, which really confused the police actually because this was a killer that seemed as though he was going to keep going. He was going to keep killing until the day that he was identified and apprehended but now he had just stopped. So what had happened to him? Had he perhaps moved away from the area? Was he just suddenly too scared of getting caught? Was he dead maybe? The police just could not understand what was going on but it was like they were constantly walking on eggshells, constantly worrying that any day now he was going to strike again. But months and years went by and that day never came. But then about three and a half years after the third murder of Casimir Peru in September of 2000, the case was still unsolved obviously and with little leads to investigate, the police decided 
decided to turn back to the DNA evidence that they had obtained years earlier, the killer's semen that was found on the body of 10-year-old Jessica Muniz. They actually decided to re-enter the killer's DNA into the DNA database to see if there was now a match on there, to see if during that three and a half year gap, the killer's DNA had been submitted onto the database. Because by this point, I believe the DNA database had expanded and the state database and the federal government database had kind of like joined together. So there were a lot more profiles on there to compare against the killer's profile. So they re-entered the killer's DNA on the database and to the police's shock, there was actually a match. Three years after the murders, they had found a match to the murderous DNA and that match was to a man named Paul Rungi. Paul Rungi was a 30 year old man who lived in DuPage County in Illinois which is roughly just over an hour's drive away from Chicago where the house fire murders took place. Although at this time in September of the year 2000 he was actually in jail for another crime obviously unrelated to the Chicago murders but we'll talk more about that in a short while. However, when the Chicago police got the match to Paul Rungi and they started looking into him and looking into his background and criminal history, they found out some things about this man that were very, very disturbing. And they knew straight away that he definitely could have been capable of committing the horrific murders that they were investigating. So let me just tell you a little bit more about him. So as I said, Paul Rungi was 30 years old at this point in the year 2000. He was born on the 28th of January 1970 and he was originally from the city of Oak Forest in Illinois. And to be honest, there really isn't much information online at all about his upbringing and his kind of family life. I know that his father was called Richard Rungi and I couldn't find the name of his mother but I know that she passed away when Paul was around 17 years old. I don't know if Paul had any siblings and if he did what their childhood was like although one documentary I watched about this case did say that Paul's mother and father were actually very good parents. They were described as being very kind and caring and there was no evidence of any any abuse or neglect going on in the home. However, despite this, according to a couple of sources, Paul Rungi developed an interest in sexual sadism from a very, very young age. Even when he was a child, he used to have fantasies about inflicting pain on women and torturing women, and he would get sexual pleasure and enjoyment out of this. And when he was just 17 years old, he decided that he was going to turn those dark fantasies into a reality. It was later in the year, on the same year that his mother passed away, when Paul Rungi somehow managed to convince a 14 year old girl to come to his home. And once she arrived, he kept her prisoner there. He hid her and he kept her locked up in the crawl space underneath her house. And there he tortured her. He raped her and he sexually assaulted her. He would cut her with a knife and he said that he was going to kill her. And I believe this lasted for a whole day. He kept her there and put her through absolute hell for a whole day. And then she somehow got out. Thankfully, she managed to escape and Paul Rungi was arrested. And for what he did to this 14-year-old girl, he was sentenced to 14 years in prison. Although in the end, he only actually served half of his sentence. He was released on parole after seven years in 1994. However, after this, it was not long at all before Paul Rungi caught the attention of the DuPage County Police, which is where he was living after he was released from prison. Less than a year after he was let out, he became the main suspect in the murder of a young woman. About two years before the murder of Dorota Duback, so the first victim that we talked about who was strangled to death and then her home was set on fire, about two years before her murder on the 16th of January 1995, the police in Lake County in Illinois received a phone call from a man, a resident of Lake County. And this man said that he had just let his dog out of his home to 
to explore. His dog's name was Friendly and I think he was quite a reliable dog so his owner didn't have to watch him at all times. Friendly was able to go off on his own in the woods nearby and his owner knew that he would always come back. So he let Friendly out on this particular day and after a short while he returned. However when he did his owner noticed that Friendly was carrying something in his mouth and this thing that he was carrying was a leg. A severed human leg. So immediately Friendly's owner contacted the police and the police went straight to his property. They took the human leg off the dog and they started searching around the area to see if they could find anything else, maybe the rest of this body that this leg had come from. And over the next couple of weeks they did find a couple more body parts. Unfortunately they didn't find all of the body parts, they didn't make up a full skeleton, but it was clear that someone had dismembered this body and then scattered the body parts around probably hoping that they would quickly decompose and just never be found. So these body parts were collected as evidence and scientists immediately got to work on trying to identify this person and eventually through DNA testing they were identified as being a woman named Stacy Froebel who had been missing for a couple of weeks by the time her body parts were found. Stacy Froebel was 24 years old and the last time she was ever seen alive was on the evening of the 3rd of January 1995 when she was at a house party and the people that were throwing this house party were actually Paul Rungi and his wife. He had a wife by this point and her name was Charlene. You see Stacy Froebel was actually friends with Paul Rungi and so she went over to his house for the party. There there were several other guests and friends there and they were just drinking and dancing and having fun. And Stacy was due to stay there that night. She was going to sleep at Paul's house. But the next morning when one of Stacy's friends, whose name was Dina Bartolini, who was actually Paul's roommate by the way, she lived in the house with Paul and Charlene. When Dina woke up that morning, she noticed that Stacy wasn't in the house, which she was expecting her to be because obviously Stacy was supposed to be staying over the previous night. But when Dina woke up, Stacy wasn't there. Her belongings weren't there and her car was no longer parked outside. So Dina approached Paul Rungi and she said, where's Stacy gone? And Paul just basically said, oh, she's already left to go home. Her husband asked her to go home and so she went. However, Stacy never actually made it home. She just never showed up and she also didn't turn up for her next shift at the bar that she worked at. In fact, the last time she was ever seen was at Paul Rungi's house. After that, she was never seen again. So because she never came home, Stacy's husband began to panic. He knew that something wasn't right here and so he decided to contact the police and report his wife as missing. And because she was last seen at the Rungi's during the house party, the police obviously began their missing person's investigation by speaking to pretty much all of the people that were at the party that night just in case any of them knew anything about Stacy's whereabouts but none of the guests had any information they all said the same thing that they were under the impression that Stacy left the party to go home so following this the police started just looking a little bit more into each person that was at the party they wanted to find out if any of them had a history of of violence or if they had ever been involved with the police before. Because if Stacey Froebel's disappearance was the result of foul play, people at that party with a criminal background are obviously going to be the first people that the police look at. And when the police looked into Paul Rungi, the party host, I guess, they were immediately suspicious of him because they found out that he was released from prison just the year before this in 1994 and he was in prison because he kidnapped and raped a 14 year old girl. So they immediately turned their attention to Paul Rungi and they questioned him about Stacey Froebel. They asked him if he had any involvement in her disappearance. 
and he said no. He said he didn't do anything to Stacey and he had absolutely no idea where she was or what happened to her. And he was described as being very cool in the interview. He remained calm. He didn't seem nervous or apprehensive in any way. The detectives that interviewed him actually said that he was quite smooth and friendly and he clearly thought that he was a lot more intelligent than the actual police than anyone he didn't say anything at all to incriminate himself he didn't give anything away however the police were still so so suspicious of him purely because of his background he had previously been convicted of raping a young girl and keeping her prisoner and then just the year after his release another woman that he is connected to goes missing and she was last seen at his house. Surely that isn't a coincidence. They were sure that he must have had something to do with whatever had happened to Stacey, but at the same time, they had no concrete evidence to prove this. And without concrete evidence, they can't charge him with anything. As we know, a couple of weeks after Stacey was reported as missing, some of her remains were found after Friendly the dog returned home and his owner noticed that he was carrying a human leg in his mouth. So it was following this that the police knew for certain that Stacy had met with foul play. Someone had murdered her, dismembered her body and then scattered her body parts around in the hopes that they would never be found and identified. And the police were still so sure that this person, the person who killed Stacy was Paul Rungi. Eventually the police started working with the FBI on this case because despite having now found Stacey's remains they still had no evidence linking Paul to the crime and they were getting desperate. They knew, they knew that this guy had done it but without any evidence they couldn't make an arrest and they urgently needed him off the streets because he was a very very dangerous man. So they turned to the FBI for assistance in the murder inquiry and one of the things that the FBI actually decided to do was enlist the help of one of Stacy's friends and Paul Rungi's roommate Dina Bartolini. FBI agents met with Dina and they basically just told her the situation that they were investigating the murder of Stacy Froebel and that they had strong reason to believe that Paul Rungi was her killer and upon hearing this Dina was just completely and utterly shocked. She lived with this man and Stacy was her friend. Paul was her friend and he was very charming and very polite so she couldn't believe that he might have had something to do with this awful crime. She actually said, quote, you'd never guess in a million years that he would ever be capable of something like this. But the FBI agents told Dina that they believed that he was and they wanted her help to try and gather some evidence against Paul. They asked Dina to wear a wire underneath her clothing and a wire is like a little hidden recording device which the police can use to listen in on conversations. So what they basically wanted was for Dina to wear this wire, meet up with Paul Rungi and his wife Charlene because at this point the police didn't know whether Charlene might have had involvement in Stacey's murder. They didn't know if she maybe assisted Paul in the crime or if she didn't assist him and she just knew what he had done or maybe she didn't know anything at all. Maybe she was none the wiser, they weren't sure. But they wanted Dina to meet up with Paul and Charlene start talking to them about Stacy and her death and see what their response would be. Whether either of them would say anything incriminating. Maybe they would even confess to Dina. And if they did, the FBI agents would hear it. They would be listening to their conversation through the hidden wire on Dina's clothing and hopefully following this, they would have enough evidence to arrest Paul Rungi. So Dina met up with Paul and Charlene. I think they went to a bar together so it was in a public place and there were undercover police outside of the bar just in case something happened in case Paul got angry and decided to attack Dina. Anyway she met up with Paul and Charlene. They started chatting and eventually Dina started mentioning Stacy. She was saying things like 
oh, have you heard anything about Stacey Froebel? Have you heard what's happened to her, etc.? But neither of them really said anything. They both stayed quiet. In fact, Paul was described as just being stone cold. It was clear to Dina that he was not going to say anything about it. He was not going to tell Dina anything. So unfortunately that plan was a bit of a fail. Nothing useful really came from that meeting and the police still had nothing, no solid evidence. And because there was no evidence, the police still could not arrest and charge him with anything. And so Paul Rungi remained a free man. However, it was not long before Paul Rungi was a suspect in yet another missing persons case. In fact, another two missing person cases. Just seven months after Stacey Froebel's disappearance and murder in July of 1995, two sisters disappeared and they were called Janetta and Amila Passenbegovic. I believe Amila was the older sister. She was 22 years old and Janetta was two years younger. She was 20. And they were originally from the country of Bosnia in southwestern Europe. But about six months before their disappearances, so in early 1995, they relocated to Hanover Park, which is a village in the Cook County and DuPage County area of Illinois. Illinois in the US and they moved in with their uncle who lived in Hanover Park but they didn't stay with their uncle for too long because after they both got jobs in a factory they decided to move out together and rent their own apartment and they were having a good time in the US. They were making money, they were making friends, they were building a life together. However unfortunately both of these sisters eventually lost their jobs at the factory that they were working at together. They were laid off. The factory was unable to keep them on and so they knew that they had to find new jobs and fast because they needed to eat and they needed to pay their bills and their rent so they started looking for employment somewhere and so on the 11th of July 1995 Janetta and Amila Passenbegovic were dropped off by one of their friends at a shopping center because they were going to look for jobs there and fill out different application forms however that was the last time the Passenbegovic sisters were ever seen. After their friend dropped them off at the shopping centre, they just vanished, both of them. No one heard from them for days and days and days and eventually I think it was about 12 days after they were last seen that their worried uncle decided to contact the police and report them as missing. As the police often do in the beginning of missing persons investigations, they began speaking to and questioning the people that the sisters knew. So they were talking to their family members and friends, any like love interests, any previous partners that they had just in case the sisters were maybe abducted or even killed by someone that they knew. But no one knew anything, no one knew where the girls were and they could never find any evidence linking any of these people to their disappearance. One theory that was put forward in the beginning was that maybe the sisters had decided to leave the area, maybe they decided to pack their things and start a new life somewhere else together. Although when the police searched their apartment, that didn't really seem likely because they hadn't taken any of their belongings with them and also their friends and family said that that just wasn't them. There was no way that the girls would just pick up and leave and not tell anyone where they were going because they wouldn't have wanted people to worry about them. So the police just couldn't work out what had happened to the girls. Where had they gone? Why had they gone? Had they met with foul play? There just wasn't really any evidence to support any theory in the Passenbegovic case. Or at least that was until the police received some information from an ex-co-worker of the girls. I believe it was a woman that the girls used to work with at the factory and I think they bumped into her at the shopping centre where they were last seen. You see this ex-co-worker was also looking for a new job just like the Passenbegovic sisters and she actually told them about some potential work that she had come across. The work was with a cleaning company that had recently been set up by a husband and his wife and so the Passenbegovic sisters asked their old co-worker if they could have the number for this cleaning company because they were interested in working for them. So the woman passed on the number, their conversation ended and she said goodbye to the girls and shortly after this, 
was when they went missing. So it was following this that the police wanted to find out more about the husband and wife that owned this cleaning company because maybe they might know something about the sister's disappearance. Maybe Janetta and Amila contacted them about potential employment and they arranged to meet them or something. So the police asked this ex-co-worker if she knew the names of the cleaning company owners and she said yes their names were Paul and Charlene Rungi. Paul Rungi, who by this point was already being looked into by other detectives and the FBI because they strongly believed that he was responsible for the murder of Stacey Froebel, which happened about seven months before the Pass and Begovich sisters went missing. But if you remember, they were never able to arrest him for Stacey's murder because they could never find any solid evidence linking him to the crime. But now the police had reason to believe that he was also involved in whatever had happened to Janetta and Amila Passenbegovic because the last time they were seen alive was by that ex-co-worker who gave them Paul and Charlene's number because they had recently set up a cleaning company and they were looking for employees. So the police immediately went to speak to Paul and Charlene. They asked them about Janetta and Amila and about their cleaning company. However, they said that they didn't know anything about what the police were talking about. They said that they had never heard of the Passenbegovich sisters, they'd never spoken to them before, and they even said that they didn't own a cleaning business. They said that Charlene used to clean houses occasionally, she used to work for another cleaning company, but they didn't have one of their own. So they were denying everything, but of course the police did not believe them for one minute. They did not believe Paul. They just thought that this cannot just be a coincidence, that he is the main suspect in the murder of a young woman, Stacey Froebel, and then just seven months later, two other women, the Passenbegovich sisters, vanish, and he has a link to them. Their ex-co-worker claimed that on the day they went missing, she put them in touch with Paul and Charlene, even though Paul and Charlene denied that. Also, just as a side note, another potential link between the two cases that the police realised was that Stacey Froebel's car was eventually found near where the Passenbegovich sisters lived. It was abandoned, I believe, just on the side of a road about a mile away from the sisters' apartment. So the police knew that it had to be Paul, but unfortunately, once again, I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but once again, just like with the Stacey Froebel case, they had no concrete proof. They couldn't prove that he did something to Janetta and Amelia. The police didn't even know if the sisters were dead or alive, but they tried so hard for months and months to find solid evidence connecting him to the crime, enough evidence to arrest him, but there was nothing. Paul Rungi was clearly a killer who knew how to cover his tracks. So because they had no evidence, the police decided to just secretly watch Paul Rungi to see if he did anything suspicious. Maybe they would catch him disposing of evidence or maybe even committing another crime. Maybe they would catch him in the act of killing if he planned to kill another person. They didn't put him under 24-hour surveillance, so they weren't watching him every second of every day, but they were trying to keep track of his movements as much as they could. Although this did not work very well, Paul Rungi actually very quickly realised that that's what the police were doing. He realised that he was being watched and he knew when he was being watched so he used to mess with the police quite a bit. When he knew that they were watching him he would wave at them and wink at them, he would play games. This was all just funny to him and he was enjoying wasting their time. So they still had nothing, absolutely nothing and it must have been incredibly frustrating for the police because I know I've said it a few times now, but they knew that he was the one that did this. They knew that he was responsible for Stacey Froebel's murder and the disappearance of the Passenbegovich sisters. He had to be. Every other person of interest or suspect that they looked into resulted in a dead end apart from him. It had to be Paul Rungi, but they just could not prove it. All they had so far in the cases 
was circumstantial evidence. So, for example, like the fact that he had a history of kidnap and sexual assault. In the Stacey Froebel case, the circumstantial evidence was the fact that she was last seen at his house. In the Passenbegovich sisters case, it was the fact that on the day they were last seen, they were put in contact with Paul and Charlene Rungi for potential employment. Although saying that, eventually the police did find a little bit more circumstantial evidence in the Passenbegovich case. So as part of their investigation, they had actually been looking through all of the Rungi's rubbish and garbage just in case Paul had maybe tried to dispose of any evidence in the bin. And about a year into the investigation, they still had nothing, but they were still going through his garbage. And one day, they found something. In one of his rubbish bags, they found a piece of paper and written on this piece of paper was Janetta and Amila Passenbegovic's telephone number and part of their address and apparently this was written in Charlene Rungi's handwriting. So this proved that Paul and Charlene had lied. If you remember when they were first asked about their cleaning business and the Passenbegovic sisters, they told the police that they had no idea what they were talking about. They had no idea who the Passenbegovic sisters were. But this proved that they did. They had the girl's phone number written down on a piece of paper. However, this was still not concrete evidence that linked them to the girl's disappearance. It was evidence that they had previously lied, but not solid proof that they or Paul did something to the girls. So still, they could not arrest him. They still didn't have enough evidence to secure an arrest warrant. But what they could do with this telephone number evidence was obtain a search warrant. They were able to get a search warrant for the run home and so they immediately went to look inside for evidence. Now unfortunately they didn't find anything in Paul's home that directly linked to the cases but they did find a lot of weapons. They found guns, they found a stun gun, knives and even a crossbow. This man had a lot of very, very dangerous weapons just stored in his house. Now, these weapons were sent off for testing to see if there was any blood on any of them, to see if maybe they had been used in Stacey Froebel's murder or in the cases of the Passenbegovich sisters, if they had been murdered. However, nothing was found, no trace of blood was found, although obviously owning weapons was a complete violation of his parole. Because he had previously been to prison, Paul obviously was not allowed to own weapons and so his parole was revoked and he was arrested and sent back to prison and he was actually ordered to serve the remainder of his original sentence. So if you recall when he was convicted of the kidnap and rape of that 14 year old girl he was sentenced to 14 years in prison but he was released on parole after seven years but now that he had broken the rules of his parole he was was ordered to serve the remainder of his original sentence. He was ordered to serve another seven years in prison and this happened in May of 1997 and this was honestly such a huge relief for the police. Yes, they still hadn't found solid evidence linking him to the cases of Stacey Froebel and the Passenbegovic sisters, but at least whilst they carried on searching, they had peace of mind knowing that he was behind bars and that he wouldn't be able to hurt anyone else. Now, after Paul Rungi was arrested and sent back to prison, the detectives turned their attention to his wife, Charlene, because they still weren't sure at this point what her involvement was. All they knew for certain was that she lied about knowing the Passenbegovich sisters. They could prove that she had lied about that because she had written their phone number down on a piece of paper, which was later found in the Rungi's garbage. So they immediately started questioning Charlene and very surprisingly, now that her husband was locked up, she decided to finally cooperate with the police. However, this was under one condition. After speaking to her lawyer, she said that she would tell the police everything she knew if they agreed that she would be granted immunity. If they promised that she wouldn't be arrested or charged or convicted of anything 
and I believe the police agreed to this because they were just desperate to finally learn the truth and get some answers for the families of Paul's suspected victims. And so Charlene Rungi started to talk. She told the detectives that on the day that the Passenbegovich sisters went missing in July of 1995, she actually picked them up from the shopping centre where they were last seen by that ex-co-worker. And she picked them up because the sisters had contacted her and Paul saying that they were looking for potential employment with their new cleaning company. So I believe Paul and Charlene were previously lying to the police. They lied about having not set up a cleaning business. They had set one up, but obviously they didn't want to admit that at the time because otherwise that would link them to the sister's disappearance. So anyway, Charlene said that she picked the sisters up from the shopping centre and she drove them back to her and Paul's house saying that they could talk more there about the cleaning company and the sisters could even potentially clean her and her husband's home. When they arrived at the house, Charlene said that the two sisters walked inside the home while she stood outside and started smoking a cigarette. However, just a couple of minutes later, Charlene was still outside and she said that one of the sisters literally ran out of the house. She was crying and screaming and Paul Rungi was running after her. And once he caught up to her, he grabbed her by the hair and he dragged her back towards the house. And to stop her from screaming, just before he got inside the house, Paul raised her head and he smashed it on the ground a couple of times until she was silent. So that either killed her or just knocked her unconscious. And once she was silent, he took her back inside. And the whole time, Charlene was just standing there watching this happen. She didn't try to stop Paul or try to help whichever sister this was. She didn't call the police. She just stood there. And then after Paul went back inside, Charlene said that she got back in her car and she just drove away. However, she returned to the house hours later. And Charlene said that when she returned and she went back into the house, she saw several bin bags, all of which were full and she never looked inside of them but she just knew what they contained. She knew that they contained the dismembered body parts of the Passenbegovich sisters. Her husband had murdered them both and then cut them up and put their remains in bin bags like they were rubbish and over the next few days Paul disposed of them like they were rubbish. He put these bin bags in various different dumpsters around the area and they were later collected by the bin men and taken to the landfill site. He had successfully disposed of the bodies of Janetta and Emila Passenbegovic and they were never found. To this day, their remains have never been recovered because obviously by the time the police received this information from Charlene, it had been a couple of years since their disappearance and murders. So there was really no chance of finding their remains now. Now I couldn't really find any information online about whether Charlene told the police anything about the murder of Stacey Froebel. I don't know if she knew for certain that Paul was the one who killed her, but she did know about the Passenbegovich sisters. And some people even speculate that she was either involved herself in those killings or she at least knew what Paul was planning to do. She knew that he was going to murder them when they arrived at the house that day. But of course, that's just speculation. I believe Charlene claimed that she didn't. She had no idea that that was Paul's plan. But I mean, regardless of whether she did or not, she wasn't going to be charged with anything because of the deal that she made with the police. Charlene Rungi was going to remain a free woman and I would be very, very interested to hear your opinions on that in the comments. But now we are going to go back to where we were ages ago in the case when we talked about the house fire murders that happened in Chicago. The murders of Dorota Duback, mother and daughter Yolanda Gutierrez and Jessica Muniz and Casimira Peru, which all happened within a span of 
of three months between January of 1997 and March of 1997. Now if you remember these murders remained unsolved for a number of years. The Chicago police were confident that they were all linked and committed by the same person but they just didn't know who that person was until three years after they occurred in September of 2000 when the police decided to resubmit the killer's DNA that was found inside 10 year old Jessica Muniz from where she had been raped. It was the killer semen. When the killer's DNA was originally entered onto the DNA database in early 1997 there was no match. However when it was resubmitted a couple of years later a match flagged up to a man who was currently in prison and that man as we know was Paul Rungi. Paul Rungi's DNA was a match to the semen that was found on 10 year old Jessica Muniz's body so they knew that he was the killer that they had been searching for for three years. And it was when the Chicago police started looking into Paul Rungi that they discovered that the police over in DuPage County and Cook County had been trying to find evidence that linked Paul to the murder of Stacey Froebel and the disappearance of the Passenbegovich sisters. So Paul Rungi wasn't just the main suspect in the house fire murders that occurred in Chicago, he was also the main suspect in two other cases that happened about two years earlier. Now if you recall from earlier on in the video we talked about how after the fourth murder in Chicago, the murder of Casimira Peru which happened in March of 1997, after her murder everything just kind of stopped. The Chicago police were honestly expecting this killer, whoever he was, to keep on killing, keep on murdering women and then setting their homes on fire to try and cover up the crime but he didn't he just stopped all of a sudden and at the time they couldn't work out why however when the Chicago police finally identified the killer as being Paul Rungi and they spoke to the police teams working on the Stacey Froebel case and the Passenbegovich sisters case they discovered the reason why the Chicago murders stopped they stopped because Paul Rungi was sent back to prison as we discussed earlier he was sent back to prison in May of 1997 after he violated his parole due to the fact that he owned several different weapons. So he was sent back and ordered to serve the remainder of his 14 year sentence which was seven years and this happened just two months after the last Chicago murder, the murder of Casimir Peru. That's why the murders in Chicago just suddenly stopped because the killer was sent to prison. So everything was starting to add up in police's minds. They worked out that after Paul Rungi killed Stacey Froebel and the Passenbegovich sisters, he decided to start killing in Chicago because he knew that the police in DuPage County and Cook County were watching him a lot of the time whilst he was there and he would have had opportunity to carry out the Chicago murders because it turns out that shortly before the first house fire murder, shortly before the murder of Dorota Duback, Paul Rungi got a new job. I believe he got a new job as a delivery driver or something like that and so he would often have to make trips to the city of Chicago so whilst he was there he would carry out these murders and then he would leave and go back to his home in DuPage County and by the time the bodies were found he was already long gone so he was never traced. Everything started to make sense and now the police had reason to believe that Paul Rungi was responsible for seven murders in total, all of which were committed between January of 1995 and March of 1997. Although so far the police only had solid evidence linking him to two of the seven murders and those were the murders of Yolanda Gutierrez and her daughter Jessica Muniz. Those were the only cases where scientists were able to 
um, retrieve some of the killer's DNA, Paul's DNA from the bodies. Unfortunately, with the other two cases that happened in Chicago, the case of Dorota Duback and the case of Casimira Peru, they weren't able to find the killer's DNA because their bodies have been too badly burnt from the fire. And as well with Stacey Froebel's murder, I don't believe they were able to find any trace of Paul's DNA because her body had been dismembered and not all of her body was found. And obviously, as we know, by the time it was found, it had been a couple of weeks since she was murdered. So any DNA that was previously present on her remains, I imagine would have just been washed off by rain or disturbed by animals or something. And also there was no DNA or forensic evidence linking Paul to the murders of the Passenbegovich sisters because their bodies were never found and have never been found to this day. There was only concrete evidence linking Paul Rungi to the murders of Yolanda Gutierrez and Jessica Muniz. And so the police basically decided that they were going to go to the prison that Paul was being held in and just see if they could somehow get a confession out of him. So in June of 2001, that's exactly what they did. They went to the jail that he was in, in Illinois. They sat down with Paul Rungi and they presented him with all of the evidence that they had collected so far in the whole investigation. So the forensic evidence and also the more circumstantial evidence too. I believe the Chicago police spoke to Paul Rungi about the murders of Yolanda Gutierrez and Jessica Muniz first and initially he denied it. He said that it wasn't him. However, after they presented him with the DNA evidence, the denial stopped and he just said, quote, you got me. He admitted that he was the one who raped and murdered Yolanda Gutierrez and her 10-year-old daughter, Jessica Muniz. And he talked the detectives through exactly how he did it. He said that he picked them as victims after he saw Yolanda's advertisement in a local shop. If you remember, she was selling some books at the time. So he contacted her. He pretended to be interested in buying the books. And then when he turned up to collect them, instead, he just killed Yolanda and Jessica. And then he set their home on fire. His confession was actually recorded. So I will try and include some clips if I can, if it's not copyrighted. But it is so incredibly chilling. He's just so calm when he's talking about this brutal crime, almost like he's just chatting with a friend about the weather. He clearly had no remorse. He felt no guilt for what he had done. He just did not care. Later down on the bed, the, the mother and her daughter came over, laid on the bed over here on, on the other side. And then uh, I took a duct, duct tape out of the pocket and I taped her hands behind her back and then the little girl's hand behind her back. There was gurgling sounds from her neck. She didn't say anything. And uh, there was blood that came out when I was there. After this, the police started asking Paul Rungi about the other murders that they suspected he was responsible for. And again, they were hoping that he would confess to them. And he basically gave the detectives an ultimatum. He said that he would tell them everything, confess absolutely everything, if they promised to send him to a different prison. Because basically he was worried that if the inmates that were in the same prison that he was in currently, if they found out that he had raped and killed a child, 10 year old Jessica Muniz, he was worried that they would kill him. So he said, if you agree to move me to a different prison, I will tell you what you want to know. So the detectives agreed and he confessed to everything. He told them about his first murder of Stacey Froebel, how he killed her on the night of his house party by beating her to death with a dumbbell. And then he talked about how he dismembered her body and then scattered her body parts in Lake County. He then confessed to the murders of Janetta and Amila Passenbegovic just seven months later. He described how when they arrived at his house that day, he tied both of them up. He raped them and then he drowned one of the sisters in the bathtub and then I believe he beat the other one to death after she tried to escape and then he dismembered the bodies. Describe for me the saw you used. Same, same, same one. Bro. Same one. Describe it for me. Uh, about this long a tree saw. Okay. Started to uh, cut. Okay. I don't know who but on the arms here. Hands. The, uh, the arms here. Uh, the ankles. 
uh, the legs and then here. Uh, did you dismember their heads? No. Okay. What motion did you have to use in order to do that? Just like uh, cutting the tree. How much force did you have to use in order to dismember them? Less than a tree branch. And he also confessed to the four house fire murders that happened in Chicago, the murders of Dorota, Yolanda, Jessica and Casimira. He said that he committed those when he knew that the police in DuPage County and Cook County weren't watching him. Like I mentioned earlier, Paul Rungi very quickly cottoned on to the fact that the police were watching him sometimes, not all of the time, but sometimes. And he knew when those times were. And he he knew to change up his method of murder too. So with the first three murders in DuPage County and Cook County, the murders of Stacey Froebel and the Passenbegovic sisters. He killed them, he dismembered their bodies, and then he scattered their body parts around in the hopes that they would never be found. And then when he realised that the police were onto him, he switched things up. He travelled to Chicago to commit his next murders. He would gain entry to his victims' homes by pretending to be interested in whatever they were selling, whether that be some books or their own homes. And then he would would kill the victims in their homes and set their property on fire to cover up the crime. Paul Rungi admitted to absolutely everything and so after the police had these detailed confessions they charged him with seven counts of murder. However unfortunately despite his lengthy confessions he would only actually be convicted of two murders. In 2006, he was convicted of the murders of Yolanda Gutierrez and Jessica Muniz because, as I've said many times, they were the only ones that the police had solid, concrete DNA evidence against him for. So for those two murders, Paul Rungi was actually given the death penalty. He was sentenced to death for what he did. But his execution day would never arrive because just five years later, in 2011, the death penalty was abolished in the state of Illinois and so his sentence was changed to just life in prison without the possibility of parole so he would never ever be released and it was following his conviction of Yolanda and Jessica's murder that the state's attorneys decided not to go forward and prosecute Paul Rungi for the other murders that they believe he had committed because he was going to be in prison for the rest of his life anyway. If he was convicted of those other murders or not, it wouldn't change his sentence. So they just decided to prosecute him for Yolanda and Jessica's murder because that was the case that they had the strongest evidence for. So Paul Rungi was never actually convicted of Dorota Duback's murder, Casimira Peru's murder, or the murders of the Passenbegovic sisters and Stacey Froebel. And I understand the reason for that like I said it wouldn't have made any difference to his sentence he was still sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole but at the same time I do really feel for the families of those victims because I think it probably would have been the closure that they needed Paul Rungi being convicted of their murders but that is it for this case that is the case of the serial killer Paul Rungi Paul is obviously still in prison to this day today he would be around 51 years old and he will remain there until the day that he dies. I really hope you guys were able to keep up with this case. I know that it was a bit all over the place at times. That's just because it is such a huge case. It was quite a struggle to research this one actually. But I hope that I explained it in a way that made the most sense and that I did the story and the victims justice. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. Also let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!